This podcast is brought to you by the Association for Coaching, an international professional body which is advancing coaching in business and society worldwide. To join our global community and access member-only webinars, events, a wide range of digital learning offerings, coaching and leadership resources, accreditation schemes, and more, you can find us at associationforcoaching.com. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Coaching in the Climate Crisis podcast series from the Association for Coaching. I'm George Warren, and I'm your host for today's episode. And today I'm joined by Elizabeth Wainwright and Katrina Horry. Elizabeth is a coach, writer, and consultant operating locally and globally, particularly with individuals and organizations working the social and environmental change. She is an elected district councillor in the UK. And Katrina is a leadership and life coach who works globally, primarily with leaders in social innovation and women looking to redefine their priorities. She is also a coaching skills trainer, including for the Mo Foundation. Elizabeth and Katrina have both undergone additional coach training with the climate change coaches. And together, they co-host a podcast called Unfurling, which explores everything from beauty to climate change, language to economics through the lens of the natural world. Elizabeth, Katrina, Hello, how are you doing? Hi, George. Hi, George. Really pleased to be here. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having us on. Well, thank you so much for being here. And it's fascinating to to learn more about the, the work that you're both doing, both individually and collectively. Well, Elizabeth, perhaps we'd start with you and hear a little bit more about the work that you're doing at the moment. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think you summed it up very well. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm doing a few things at the moment. So I am a writer. I do freelance writing for magazines like Geographical Magazine. And I am also an elected district councillor down in Devon. I sort of accidentally got elected a couple of years ago and I stuck with it. And yeah, it's fascinating. And I'm sure we might touch on that a bit more later on in terms of how that connects into climate and nature. And then when I'm not doing that, I'm a coach as well. So I work mostly with groups of people, actually communities, primarily at the moment in Africa and India through a charity that I developed and increasingly with individuals who are working on, you know, in the, in the charity world, in the local authority world, on social and environmental change. So doing a few things, but yeah, enjoying them all in different ways and to different degrees. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing that, Elizabeth. And uh, yeah, absolutely looking forward to hearing more about that in a moment. And Katrina, hello. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Thank you, George. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, you you summarised very well what I am doing right now. So I'm more focused on one-to-one than groups. And yeah, my background prior to coaching was in the charity world, both working in charities and with them in London, New York and, and beyond. So yeah, my coaching work, the leadership side of things is typically with leaders in social innovation. So people in nonprofits, education, social enterprises, CSR. And then I also work with women who are looking to kind of really explore um, and embrace their priorities at this time in life. So that's really the life side of things. And I do most of it remotely, but some of it I do do in Battersea Park in London, where I'm based. And so yeah, nature started to permeate my coaching world. And then I think with Elizabeth, nature has started to to come more and more to the fore with our work. Wonderful to hear. I know Battersea Park very well. I used to do a lot of running there and I, I love the idea of doing some coaching there as well. How does that work? Well, I kind of know most of the spaces in Battersea Park. So I kind of always meet in the middle with my clients in the bandstand area. And I just kind of say, north, we've got the Peace Pagoda, south, there's more tropical places. And I kind of explain roughly where a few things are, and then I let them lead. And it's really a a combination of walking, but also then stopping and and being still. And I think it's really important that the the clients um, really in charge of that process, knowing that I can point them in different directions if they're they're not feeling it. But it's it's always curious about who chooses where and when. And I've, I've had some really beautiful moments with people. Just, I think there's something about, even in London, which is obviously a very busy city, and I know we're not, when I think of Battersea Park or any park, it's not classic nature or wild, certainly. And yet there's something about that that open space, the greenness, the, yeah, the lack of structure somehow within what is probably quite structured compared to where Elizabeth lives. But nonetheless, there's something very freeing about it. And interestingly, whilst I do work 
mostly with women. I, I do work with some men and men seem to love it too. It's uh, a nice time away from the office often for people, both men and women. I can really resonate with that. And yeah, certainly that's part of the reason I live where I do up here in, in Snowdonia. And I coaching uh, Wimbledon Common and Richmond Park when I was living in London. And oh, lovely. They're, yeah. they're actually so big that you can get lost. And it's a really nice metaphor for, mm. for letting the client lead, as you said and not knowing where you're going and it being okay. So I've got a big smile on my face hearing about, about Palisade Park there. Yeah, and I think what you say about metaphors as well is, is really important. So it's not just being in the park. And yeah, I love Richmond, uh, Richmond Park and Wimbledon Common. They're slightly more wild. You know, what can we notice around us as people are talking about their lives, even just as basic as choosing two different objects on the ground that represent where they are and where they want to be can be incredibly powerful mm. as people. So it's not just being outdoors, but it's also looking for what metaphors we can find that relate back to the coaching can be important. Mm, and we, just thinking of Battersea Park in particular, Kat, we mm. ran some workshops there, didn't mm. we? Some great did, workshops yeah. and in Battersea Park, very much drawing on, yeah, what people are drawn to, the metaphor, the literal. It was really good. Really enjoyed that. Something else that came to mind, actually, that I'm doing at the moment is training for my hill and moorland leader qualification mm. so i've got a kind of vision of taking people out onto dartmoor or exmoor or other upland areas in the uk and getting lost getting found exploring seeing what comes up mm. avoiding rain and avoiding bogs hopefully <laughs> but yeah just kind of a bit of structure a bit of being held but equally some freedom as well so i'm doing my assessment in a few months when the weather is suitably grim so yeah looking forward to kind of bringing that more into the coaching space and just really enjoy i think that's one of the reasons we enjoy working together that that we kind of span the the city the urban mm. um, and the nature that is everywhere actually in, yeah. in cities and equally the more kind of rural expansive moorland and fields and farms and woods as well so it's sort of bringing worlds together and recognising there is nature to be found or the micro and the macro in both of those places. Yeah, and even if you're not together as a coach and coachee, I've had clients phone me under trees, poignant moments. I've had one client up a tree <laughs> phoning me, which did slightly make me nervous about my insurance. But again, you don't always have to be together as long as there's you know good enough reception. The clients can be outdoors wherever they live. Yeah, I think that's one of the clearest benefits of What's happened in the last year and a half with COVID to the coaching industry is that it's made it a lot more accessible. I think it, there was a sort of cliche mm. of traveling to London and going to a, a, a big sort of glass walled office. And what's happened is that <laughs> yeah. it's really this, this pandemic has really forced the industry to, to embrace phone coaching, Zoom teams coaching. And, and I've personally hugely enjoyed that. And I've, I've been out for walks where, where I'm up here in Wales and my clients are all around the world walking at the same time. It's a great example for me that you don't need to be in the same room as someone in order to help them with coaching. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's something about meeting people where they're at as well. And as you say, the access mm. and, and you know, it's, coaching is such a powerful tool and way of being. It's how do we really open it up so so everyone can benefit not just people sitting inside offices in the city perhaps yeah yeah and I think Elizabeth that reminds me of our approach to things as well as we're really keen that our work's not exclusive that nature isn't seen as something that can only be accessed with a, a great deal of money or the ability to travel to it that we can find our little slices of the natural world wherever we are whether it's just a local park absolutely and there's a lot of conversation around how you know we are not separate from nature we are nature we've evolved yeah, exactly. alongside yeah. the natural world so it's it's almost re if we feel that disconnect from it it's almost refinding our place in it which has always been there but maybe we feel a bit distant from that at the moment you know for some people one thing i'm i'm hearing and feeling from from our conversation already is just how much nature and the natural world is is weaved in to the not only the coaching work you do but but it sounds like a lot of the things you do and i'm imagining some listeners here maybe coaches themselves or or leaders who coach or those interested in coaching wondering how do you do it and how have you got to a point where where nature and and the natural world is is interwoven so closely with your practice you know when i think of coaching and i, I suppose it's because i my kind of the bulk of my training came through the coactive training institute cti 
where we, we look at both the being and the doing. So traditionally, I've been very good at doing in my life, but the being part was a little bit like, what's that? But actually, I think that being part's been really important for both Elizabeth and me in that nature isn't something we've just discovered in the last year. It's been really fundamental to who we are. So I grew up in the countryside, in a small town in the countryside, and my parents were both in biology and conservation. My dad was one of the founders of the Ramsar Convention back in the 70s, which protects wetlands around the world. And my mum studied the behaviour of swans for 10 years. So I very much grew up surrounded by nature and a real appreciation for it, both from a scientific but also a a kind of well-being perspective. We always made sure we went on really nature-based holidays. Yeah, I loved my, my first one of my first schools was an old arboretum. We used to wear boiler suits <laughs> and wellies mm. down to break. So for me, it's it's been a kind of a natural evolution to kind of start getting this into my practice. We can talk perhaps in a moment about how COVID's perhaps focused us even more. I will say though, in my 20s and possibly early 30s, I, I, I did take my eye off nature a bit because I had been traveling, doing expeditions in wild places like Mongolia and things like that. But I did get quite urban focused living in London and then New York and now back in London. So for me, I think, yeah, it's probably been the last six years or so that I've started almost remembering a bit more about my childhood and that seeped through into my work. Yeah, I mean, there's a similar track there in terms of the place and importance of nature in my whole life, certainly from when I was young and growing up near the sea, um, surrounded by woods. Lovely, lovely things. And I feel very lucky to have done that. Well, when I first went to university, I was studying medicine. Um, and a couple of years into the course, I went to Africa, to Zambia for the first time. Just this whole world opened up to me, literally, in terms of the nature and people there, but also just a sense of who I was. And I saw this whole world that was bigger than just fixing people physically, as important as that is. And I had this real kind of clarifying moment of, I think it was looking up at the stars one night in Zambia and just thinking, gosh, there's so much beauty in this world and there's mm. so much joy and there's so many lessons here. You know, there's this kind of bigger picture of things um, that need addressing if people are to be truly healthy. And long story short, I came back, stopped doing medicine, changed, got a degree in biology. So I kind of have that background and then moved into the charity world and worked in international development for a long time. Spent, you know, spent quite a lot of time in Africa. I lived in Zambia for some time working with a charity. And again, like, I found that nature there is a very different kind of nature, obviously, to the UK and to Devon, where I am now. But the role of the natural world in helping me to think when I was in Zambia, helping me in really difficult moments, allowing me to express and feel joy. I feel like it's been a kind of a cornerstone of my journey so far. And more recently, I've, I've been naming that and saying, OK, if that's true, what does that look like in my work? So I worked for, I was an editor on Resurgence magazine for, for a time, which is the UK's oldest environmental magazine. And as I say, I'm, I'm a green district councillor now, so do a lot of work on kind of response to the climate crisis locally. And it's just been there. I, I, I sort of hesitate to call nature a value because I don't, I see it yeah. as deeper than that. It's not just a value. It's it's like a, it's a, I don't know, it's part of me almost, which sounds really cheesy I think but it's a love of it and appreciation for it and also like a humility around it you know nature has had what four billion years of research mm. and development and trial yeah. and error mm. and if that's true what lessons does it hold that actually we could or should or, or might do well to learn from and as I say recognizing that humans are part of that so I'm not separating here I love humanity as much as I love trees it mm. for me it's all the same thing so yeah it's, it's just been a presence intentionally less intentionally i think through my whole life and, and my work thanks for sharing elizabeth and one thing is it's wonderful to hear that and one thing that sparked for me is that this idea that more and more as i've as i've been educating and having conversations around the climate crisis is that when we talk about the environment or even nature there's a risk of talking about it almost as an abstract, as if it's something else, when in fact, mm. we, you and I on this call, are, are part of nature and the environment by by the very nature of yeah. our existence. I go back actually to, to, to contexts like across Africa, where I've lived and work, and just 
you go there and you see that nature isn't this separate piece that people are coming back to. It's it's always been there and it is part of the kind of natural rhythms of a day, of a year, of a lifetime. That really strikes me. Whereas here, it's different. Uh, And I now live sort of around a farming community. And again, I see those rhythms come into play. You know, we rely on the land. It's part of our lives. It isn't separate. And yet, sometimes it can be easy to, to think we are separate, whether that's through our work, through the franticness of life. You know, life sometimes feels hectic. Mm. And nature is never hectic. And I think that's something that can separate us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah, it depends on the way you live as well. I mean, being in London or a, a big city, it's easy to get caught up in the pace and, and not notice what's going around you. And actually, one of the benefits of particularly the first lockdown last year with COVID is that we were just allowed to go for a, a local walk. So my family and I go around a, a very small park near us each day and my then three-year-old son would take photos of flowers and even over I can't remember how long it was two or three months period it was fascinating actually just noticing how things were changing flowers were blooming or then turning over and I wouldn't have noticed all of this in real life and so I think with COVID it kind of brought this beautiful kind of space to appreciate whatever natural world is around us. Yeah I totally relate to that Katrina, and and you mentioned the C word there, COVID. I'd love to hear your thoughts or both of your thoughts, in fact, on how the other C word, coaching, how coaching has has had to evolve since and and during COVID and the pandemic. What have you noticed and what what are your takeaways from from what's happened in the past couple of years? Well, for me, in some ways, it hasn't changed things that much because I was doing most of my coaching over the phone. And I, I did that for two reasons. One was I have a family of two very young boys. I wanted to be able to coach remotely so that I could continue to work, but also be a very present mum. So that allowed me to do that. So in some ways that didn't change. I I now am more proficient on Zoom. Uh, I can coach with video on. Yeah, but I guess in terms of what, what was different, I've noticed, I've noticed a lot of guards going down. And that includes in me as a coach, starting to let go of a need to prove myself and be professional. I mean, it's still there. I'm not going <laughs> to say it's not, but mm. but a little bit of that softening of guards. And I've noticed that in my clients as well, that perhaps maybe what I might have taken a couple of sessions to kind of get into things, like people are almost presenting themselves like, hey, here I am a bit more and here's my life. And actually you can see my kitchen behind me because I'm speaking from home and I have my children in the next door room. So I feel mm. like it's actually... Whilst, of course, it's caused a lot of real challenge and stress and strain in some ways, it's also brought around much more vulnerability and honesty. That's what I've noticed. Yeah, yeah, I really resonate with that, that vulnerability. And I think it's been a time of being okay with questions. I think mm. I think more and more yeah. questions are coming up, whether that's about ourselves as individuals and what we might choose to do next or how we might respond to the strangeness of the last 18 months. But equally collective questions, what got us to this place? What does it mean as we look forward? What are we going to take forward with us? What are we going to leave behind? And for me, it was a couple of other C words that come to mind here. One is climate, which I'm sure we'll come on to. And then community as well. For me, Mm. it's it's really highlighted the role of community. It's, it's, I feel maybe that it's brought us closer together in in some ways. I've certainly felt that in communities I'm part of. Recognising too that we may have been in the same storm, but we're in different boats in the Mm. last year. We have different access to the resources that we might need to to help us, completely recognising that. But there's sort of collective questions, I think, that have come Mm. up. And one is, how do we walk together through this? And how how do we respond collectively and individually t- to these challenges I mean, it's a reprioritizing for some people I've definitely heard that and felt that myself but equally collectively it's a reprioritizing and I'm keen to see what that looks like through governments through organizations through communities what does that really mean if that's true yeah yeah I kind of feel that unknowingness is is important here because often with coaching well certainly when I started coaching I thought it was all about goals. Here's your goal. Where are you at right now? What are your options? How are you going to get there? And and that still has value. And yet, during the last 18 months, we haven't always been able to set goals in the traditional way. What does, mm. 
what does success in coaching mean? Is it about always achieving, ticking things off and achieving the next job or whatever? Or is it about, and or, it could be, and or is it about really going deeper and understanding oneself with the, once we're, yeah, more self-aware, then being able to go out into the world and contribute more and in a more fulfilling and even easier way. Yeah, and connected to what you mentioned about vulnerability is almost the the, the power of saying, I don't know. That, mm. That's really come up for me as an organisation, as an individual, whatever. But it's OK not to know, particularly in the face of new challenges. And that, that's felt powerful. So we've heard about the COVID crisis. And of course, we're, we're in a much wider global crisis around, around the climate crisis too. So I'd really welcome your thoughts on, on how the coaching skills and really not just from coaches, but for everyone, how coaching skills can help in this in this climate crisis. Mm, yeah, thanks for the question. It's a, it's a good question and it's a big question, I think. And I think there's lots of people probably thinking about that question actually at the moment. A few of the things that come up for me, um, and I know for us it, it, as well. Well, one is that it's, it's one of the kind of core coaching skills of, of just purely listening and being curious around what the experts have to say, but actually what all of us have to say and all of our lived experience of what this crisis means for us so you know someone down the road from me a farmer in Devon that answer will be quite different to a community leader in Kenya for example where I do some work so something about really listening and saying okay what is this looking like for people it can be so tempting to want to be the expert and to want Mm. to have all the answers but actually just being quiet and just absorbing there's a quote and Kat will have heard me say this about a million and one times, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's a quote I really love from the biologist E.O. Wilson. And he says, the world is drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. And that the world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people able to put together the right information at the right time. Mm. And for me, there's something about, we do, I think, maybe live in the world of the expert. And that's really great and important, but equally to really benefit from the wisdom of individuals and the collective. It is about hearing stories, about being curious and about putting that together in a way that doesn't just instill panic and fear, whilst that does come up, obviously, around the climate crisis, but also encourages solutions and opportunities and possibilities and even joy. What might be possible as we create change and come up with solutions. So some of those things, listening, curiosity, synthesising information and stories, and not just looking for the experts. There's something about holding everyone as equal. We all have different backgrounds and skills, but it's kind of coming at this like peers rather than people that are higher up or lower down because climate change is affecting and will affect us all. We were quite... We, we felt it really important and we've done two episodes on climate change as part of our Unfurling podcast. And in the second one, we spoke at length, well, actually, I interviewed Elizabeth in her role as a district councillor. We spoke to a friend of mine who works for a green energy company called Orsted. Her name's Anna Westall. But we also spoke with two men based in Kenya, Robbins Ochin Adio and Nicholas Keita, about the community work they're doing out there in terms of climate change in a place called Kiptere. And that felt really important in that episode to bring in those diverse voices from around the world and different skill sets and backgrounds. And I think it kind of goes back to the, the original point about expertise. I remember when I start, I both Elizabeth and I have done a course with the Climate Change Coaches, which was founded by Charlie Cox. It's a, a coaching circle. I think it's 12 weeks. And I remember at the start of doing that, I was like, well, who on earth am I to be doing this? Like, I, yes, I do have a biological background. I did human sciences at university, but, you know, I, I don't work in that arena. And I felt a huge amount of imposter syndrome and, and really questioning about the value that I would bring. And it was so important to go through that process and come out the other side. And actually, the skills I do have are in, in coaching. And, and what we learned from that course, we learned lots of different things, but the things I really took away from it were, how can we be with people with their emotions around climate change. So be that grief, be that anger, scarcity, overwhelm. How can we be with people and acknowledge that, be with it, but also help them reconnect with their their innate power and find the agency that works for them given their their context and skills. So yeah, I think taking that peer-to-peer approach 
respecting and listening to experts and also being okay that we're not all experts and we don't know the answers, I think is important. It's great to hear that. And it's great to hear as well your experiences on the, the climate change coaching course. So I've taken that myself. And, and in fact, Charlie Cox is a guest on this podcast series. So she'll be really happy to hear um, that all three of us uh, have attended that. Katrina, thanks for sharing that sense of mm. who am I to be having this sort of conversation. That's something I, I really grappled mm. with as well. I'm just a uh, dot, dot, dot. Who am I to be doing this? And that maybe that fear of being challenged or criticized or even called hypocrite as well for having a conversation around it and mm. in my experience I work a lot with, with with new coaches and in my experience that that can be a bit of a blocker to action for for a lot of us mm. and it, it maybe it nearly was for me as well getting involved in in these sorts of conversations and I'm wondering if in your experience or through your podcast or, or through your coaching you've experienced something similar I think that's a really great question and it's definitely something that I have grappled with in different ways not least when I like I said earlier accidentally got elected and <laughs> I, I suddenly found people coming to me expecting me to be some expert on conservation and, and, and the environment and climate change and so on and I'm not but actually I've tried to flip that and see that as a strength and what I mean by that is I think whilst we need things like technology and finance and all of that to help us as we tackle the climate crisis I think what we really need more than that even is good relationship and being able to be be with each other even when each other might be totally different and completely it might be someone we just don't agree with or just can't connect with so there's something about relationship building and I think I've realized that, that is a real strength and going back to the idea of vulnerability and saying, I don't know, but actually I know something. Please, can I have a coffee with you and can we learn together on this? I think we've known about the the, the climate crisis for, for decades now, but we are kind of in uncharted territory. And I think it's going to take all of us connected through relationships to get to the other side. And I think, I mean, there is that, that quote that's often said about, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? But I think it's true. And I think for me, it comes back to where am I feeling pulled to? When do I come alive and how do I use that to respond to this? So yes, I might not be an expert on whatever climate finance or wind turbines, but I am creative and I am perceptive and I am good at listening to people. And they're my, some of my superpowers. So how do I share those with others and, and trust that that is enough? It will never be enough on its own, which is where the relationship comes in. If I can bring those superpowers and you can bring your superpowers, that's a, that's a great toolkit mm -hmm. that we ha then have between us. So it's something about trusting who we are, where we're pulled to, what gives us energy. It's often a good sign that that's something for us to invest energy in as well. It, it shouldn't be a slog. We looked at one of our episodes on unfurling from that kind of strengths-based approach. What are we already good at? And I think there's something about being able to find the people that do the things that we can't do and, and being able to, to reach out and network, communicate, have dialogues. There's something for me also that I've grappled with, I still grapple with, around climate change, around anti-racism work. And I'm not there yet completely, but there's something about settling into an element of hypocrisy. <laughs> right? Because it can feel like you have to be perfect at climate change. You know, you have to be living this purest life in order to be, you know, in the climate change arena. And I, I'm not, I'll be honest, I am in certain ways, but I'm not in other ways. And yet, if I let that hold me back from doing anything or being anything, then who's that serving? No one. Similar with anti-racism work. So I think there's being okay with discomfort. And I think that, that always makes me think then back to the natural world. I mean, it's easy with nature-based work or nature-inspired work to look at the beautiful Instagram photos and the, the joy and the wonder and the beauty of, of the, the natural world, which is, is absolutely there. And there's also some really challenging parts of the natural world, suffering, mm -hmm. drought, visual ugliness. And I think that's within us too. So I guess where I'm at, and I have noticed in some of my clients as well, is how can we start to just accept that in ourselves because I think it's when you when you're more and more accepting of the shadow sides or the the areas you're not doing brilliantly in it, it still allows movement and that movement's important because at least then you are contributing something 
I couldn't agree more. And that phrase, uh, fr- a lovely phrase that popped into my mind, which I've really worked with in the last couple of years has been a sense of being perfectly imperfect, mm. recognizing and honoring yeah. our imperfections and naming them, calling them out so that mm-hmm. they don't <laughs> loom so, so, so big and so dark over us. Mm. And there's a line by, I don't know, some musician that talks about if we can see our shadow, it means that we're walking towards the light. So there's something around, we're facing the light in, in the right direction. There's always going to be a shadow behind us. And it's something about not letting that, as you say, hold us back, but keeping on moving forward. It was I can't remember if I was talking about this with you recently, Kat, but there's an author I really enjoy, Parker Palmer. And he talks about the idea of standing in the tragic gap, he calls it, which is on the one hand, it can be very easy to be cynical and, and sort of sit back and say, well, we're all doomed, can't do anything, that's me. And then on the other hand, it can be easy to fall into kind of wishful thinking, over-optimism, everything's rose-tinted, which is also, it can be damaging. And he talks about the need to you know, recognise the realities, but also mo- move forward. And he calls out the sort of tragic gap between those poles. And for me, that really resonates. It will be uncomfortable, but... As long as you can keep taking one step and one step and then another step before you've walked thousands of miles. Mm. And I think, mm. yeah, that, that feels important for me. I, th- I think actually that reminds me as well. Of, we've spoken to a few coaches in the last few weeks that are really interested in nature and coaching in nature. And, and there seems to be this feeling like you have to have this certification to do that and you need to you know, that there's a formula and way of doing things. And of course there will be, and they, it's quite a new area in some ways, but also a hugely an area that's gone back thousands of years. And I think there's something about just trusting ourselves, as long as you have the right insurance if you're taking people up mountains and things mm-hmm. like that. But there's, there's something about it's available to all of us. And so I'd really encourage people just to, to get going. One of my, my friends, Tony Phillips, likes to use the, the phrase, ready, fire, aim. And so it's, it's getting into action and then kind of fine tuning thereafter. But that also feels important here. Yeah, and, and recognising just, I, I sometimes get worried or, or maybe concerned that the nature stuff can, can feel a bit like a bandwagon. It's suddenly everywhere and you, you walk down the high street and, and I was just thinking a couple of months ago, all the shops were sort of using plastic plants and fake leaves and, and colour and it's, it looks great visually and it, it's nice, but it you know how long will that last? So there's something around what are the stuff that might just be here for a moment and then go and where is the actual deep work and where is mm. the kind of real truth and differentiating between the kind of, the frantic urgent sense that oh I should be doing that because everyone else is versus actually who am I and where am I and how am I called and how do I best serve who I am and and Mm. the way I'm made up but also the ecosystem literally and metaphorically that I'm part of and that might be completely different to what everybody else is doing and the image that comes to mind there actually is there's a world out there, but the way I see it is very different from how a bat sees it. It's very mm. different from how a fly with its lots of lenses sees it. It's the same world seen in completely different ways. And it's about honouring that and saying, well, this is how I see it. How do you see it? And how do we walk forward in that together? So I heard you use the word ecosystem a couple of times. And I, I saw a, a wonderful phrase mm. that you take an ecosystem approach to coaching. And I, I was wondering if you'd like to say a bit more about that. Yeah, so I think as particularly in the the last year, as Elizabeth and I have been working on the podcast, and I guess l- learning our lessons from the lessons that we've learned from each episode, just really placing ourselves in our individual ecosystems feels so important. So really understanding where each of us is within our own lives, physically, but also in terms of our relationships, our work, but really kind of imagining that as an ecosystem and and, and using that metaphor. And then it's from that place, it's it's moving inwards. And we we like to think about the idea of head, heart and body. So the head perspective. So when you're you're looking more inwards, it's and, and with nature, it's kind of either being out with nature or, or reflecting with that, but looking and learning, being curious, becoming informed. The heart is more about appreciation and love and being inspired and also other emotions, you know, the more challenging ones like we've named around climate change, but which also mm. come up in different contexts, especially in COVID, grief, anger, sadness, but also thinking about the body. So we kind of 
this might be internal reflection, it might be out in, in the natural world. The body kind of, for me, is around action. It's kind of, so what? What are we going to do with the, the learnings that we're taking? And what are we going to be choosing? And, and with that knowledge, it's then putting ourselves back in our ecosystems and really thinking about what are we going to be doing? How are we going to be being, um, be being? Yeah, I guess it's kind of the external going internal, back external, but it feels important to link these two worlds. And I think that's something that I've really enjoyed working with Elizabeth about because my focus has been more on the one-to-one arena and Elizabeth also does one-to-one, but also has more experience with the group and facilitations. So really important. Yeah. And, and just picking up on that, just we're really keen to draw out that connection between the individual, as you say, Kat, we've talked about the head and the heart and the body, but also the collective and the, mm. and the systems. And you can't have one without the other. A body is made of many parts and a nose won't work on its own. It needs the whole body to, to function, right? And that mm. the body will only work if there's a healthy nose. And it, there's something there. And, and I think kind of zooming out, that's something that we try and do more generally. It's that how do we bring together individual collective and also the, the kind of s- slow contemplative and the more urgent and also the urban and rural. There are kind of these mm. worlds that we're interested in and we're keen to bring them together and learn from both of them and, and mm. discourage the polarisation that can sometimes creep in um, and encourage that, as you say, the ecosystem a- approach to this work. Yeah, it's kind of bringing in the best of all worlds um, whilst recognising the challenges that come with those worlds as well. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That was a yeah, beautiful explanation. And the question that sparked for me was for our listeners and for those that coach who are interested in what you've shared, what might be some resources that you'd like to signpost our listeners towards? Hmm. So it's a couple of things and I'm sure there'll be links when you post this. Obviously there's our podcast, Unfurling. So that's on all the kind of main podcast channels. If you search Unfurling podcast, you'll find it. And that is, yeah, it's really been a journey as as Kat mentioned earlier. It's something that started during lockdown. In fact, we're kind of celebrating our one year mm. anniversary, aren't we, Kat? Yeah, yes. I think we worked out on is it July the 23rd, something like that. It is. So yes. there's that. It's been going a little while. We also have a website, which we can put the link to in your notes. And we have our social media channels. Yeah. Yeah. And and for those that get into the podcast, we have a small but beautiful Facebook group Mm. called Unfurling Podcast, where we exchange ideas about what we can learn through the lens of the natural world. So... Yeah, I mean, I I think where we're at is it it, is it for us it's an unfurling journey. All of this Mm. and there's the coaching element, there's facilitation training elements, but it's it's a journey and there's something lovely about not forcing it, not not having to have pitch perfect about everything. It feels like a real honour, actually, you know, Mm. to be like we don't know everything, (laughs) we're still on our journey, and that and that I, I feel like that's a real nature based approach. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's it's kind of symbiosis as well that comes to mind that you see in mm. nature. And I think I love working with Kat for lots of reasons, but, but I think we work really well together and it's that kind of we're more than the sum of our parts mm. and we both bring our strengths. But there is also this third piece, which is the kind of alchemy between our way of working, which I think, yeah, it's, it's a real, yeah, it's, it's just feeling that pull towards who we are and how we add value to this world which is such a beautiful world and that's our kind of deep motivation it's just so much beauty and joy here how do we reflect that back Mm. equally into contexts that can be challenging and that's the journey that we're on so yeah please join us and what would you like to say to the listeners who would like to bring more of the lens of the natural world into their what into their coaching into their careers into their lives well as a basic step just do it. Just step outside your door or even even have plants indoors. I think it's important not to build it up as being something that has to be achieved. Go down your street, find a hedge, find a tree. I love I love taking photos of my iPhones of like flowers up close. I find it really therapeutic. It really helps me remind me about what an amazing world we're in. It takes me out of my head. There are lots of different ways to get involved, either walking or sitting or running, whatever it is. But just just get started is the first thing. And it's almost like, I think with this work, 
It's really almost like soaking yourself in the natural world so that you're feeling restored, you're feeling inspired. You're also feeling passionate about it because I, I do feel that for real change around climate change, for example, people need to love the natural world. Otherwise, why bother? Unless you're in, in Christ, proper, proper climate change crisis, which we will be at some point here in the UK, but we're not quite there, well, at least for many people. So really diving into that love of the natural world feels important. Yeah, echo all of that. And also, you know, we do, going back to the point about us wanting for our work, certainly for it to feel inclusive, it's recognising too that some people either don't have immediate access to some kinds of nature or maybe are fearful around what nature brings up linked to kind of mythology and stories and the scary woods and what's in Mm. them. And so there's something around, as, as you said, Kat, it's kind of going where you're drawn, going where you find energy. If you'd like to go for a walk, but you're nervous, go with someone. If you'd like to explore new kinds of landscape, find out who's there and ask to sort of tag on to what they're doing. It's that kind of being curious and actually reminds me of, well, the weeds that we have on our allotment. They are going nuts at the moment. They're kind of creeping and finding nooks and crannies and coming up. And there's something that comes to mind there. It's about how do we put out our tendrils and see what they grip onto and see where we're drawn to is that particular people particular landscapes books whatever it might be just I think it's about following curiosity and seeing Mm. what comes back and yeah because for this work to be sustainable we need to be sustained ourselves Mm. we need to have energy we need to feel joy or whatever other emotions give us energy Uh, and I think that's important you know I have a lot of friends who are in the activist world and I worry about exhaustion and burnout of Mm. of people in that world. And I've definitely felt that myself, not so much now, but in the past. So there's something about, yeah, taking care of each other as well. And yeah, really being curious. I think that's the biggest thing for me. And there's a beautiful circuitous theme for me in hearing you say about taking care of ourselves and others is that for many of us, nature is a healer and spending time surrounded by nature or admiring nature, as, as you said, Katrina, is a great rejuvenator, is a great recharger, is a great rebalancer for us. It's a great source of nourishment for us. Yeah, it's, def- it's definitely, certainly since I've been self-employed, I think it's seven years now, like I always go out for a walk each day. I live in central London, but I always make sure I go to a park because I think having grown up in, in the countryside particularly, it's just getting that green in my eyes is so important mm. um, for my mental well-being. So, and, and knowing that it might not be for everyone. I, just, I, I, I don't want to be pushing nature on people. But I think the word curiosity is important, Elizabeth. And we'd encourage, if anyone's listening, that that doesn't feel comfortable walking in the natural world, to reach out to us. We, we're very happy to to talk this kind of thing through. Yeah, yeah. The individual well-being piece feels important. And I'm so encouraged that there are there's, there's apps and books and all sorts on on how we can use, as you say, George, kind of nature to be a healer and to, to restore. I'm also curious what collective well-being looks like mm. through the lens of the natural world and how do we heal communities? How do we heal organizations so that you know they too can can benefit from the natural world? There's something about yeah, he- healing is a important piece, I think. Well, Katrina and Elizabeth, thank you so much for for joining me for today's conversation or what well, I should call it today's journey. It's been great to go on that journey with you and hear your experiences <laughs> and, and your stories. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for having us, George. Yeah. It's, it's been a pleasure to to have this conversation with you and explore together. Yeah, and it's, it's really exciting what the Association for Coaching are, mm. are doing around this work. So yeah, really happy to be part of your own journey. So thank you for inviting us on. This podcast was brought to you by the Association for Coaching. Discover more business coaching resources, thought leadership and online learning at associationforcoaching.com.